All right. Hello, everybody. This is Kosh, your station director, coming at you from Four Far Field Station. We're really excited to have you here. Today, as you can tell, we're going to be talking about mangroves. Uh, I'm just going to wait a few minutes so that more people can kind of come in and watch with us. So hold tight, and Alex will get started shortly. Hi everyone, welcome back to our webinar series. Um, I am Alex, an environmental educator here at Four Far Field Station. And as you can see, we're gonna talk about mangroves today. So to start out, what are mangroves? So mangroves are trees um, and shrubs that live in the coastal intertidal zone. There are 80 different species and they all grow in environments characterized by sediments with low oxygen levels and live in very soft sediments, salty waters, and or brackish waters. It is calculated that mangroves cover 75% of tropical and subtropical shorelines and 25% of the coastlines of the Caribbean. You can see in the map here where they grow, which is typically along the globe's center line and along the coast. They occupy a total area ranging between 167,000 and 181,000 kilometers squared, uh, spread over 120 countries, with regions in Southeast Asia hosting the highest mangrove biodiversity. So the type of mangroves that we're going to talk about today, uh, there are four different ones that we're going to talk about. Um, and mangroves are determined by tidal changes, elevation, salinity, and oxygen levels of the soil. Uh, and for today, we are going to talk about red mangroves, black mangroves, white mangroves, and also buttonwood. So to start, we will start with our red mangroves. Uh, the name comes from their red roofs, uh, red roots, and they are known as the pioneer plant. Um, they are usually the first plants to grow in a new area. 
and their seeds are very successful because the sprout can grow up to a foot long before leaving the tree. And then once the seedlings leave the tree, they float until the pointed end sticks into the sediment and starts to grow. So you can see that nice little seed pod there in that first photo. They are also the dominating mangrove uh, of the mangrove forest and they are located most seaward. They also have external prop roots. So you can see those external prop roots in both of those photos there. These prop roots create a stability for the tree, supply oxygen to under roots, as well as a nursery for animals to breed. Because of their location, red mangroves are haliophytes, meaning they survive in saltier than normal conditions, which means they have adapted uh, in order to conserve water. This adaptation uh, is actually a waxy cuticle on its leaves, which prevents evaporation. Red mangroves also create new soil. Uh, they drop more than three tons of dead leaves per an acre per year, and those dead leaves get caught in their prop roots. As these leaves decompose, it creates a new soil. However, the soil is low in oxygen. And why it's low in oxygen is because in order to decompose, the leaves, bacteria, and other decomposers use up the oxygen in the soil. So after many seasons of this, you are left with really rich, low oxygen soil, and now other many plants are able to start growing within that soil. Our next mangrove is black mangroves. So black mangroves are best known for pneumanophores. So these are also known as snorkel roots. Um, black mangroves have solved the problem of growing in anoxic or not oxygenated sediments and with these snorkel roots. And these rootlets grow off the root um, and take in the oxygen from the air, which is actually pretty cool. They also have salt excretion that is through the leaves. Um, the salt pores are on the back of the leaves and they leave little salt crystals that are normally found again behind that leaf and these plants can live in either brackish or mix their salt in fresh water or saline environment. Black mangroves also can produce a mangrove honey which can be eaten which is a pretty cool little trait about them. Our next mangrove is the white mangroves. These guys are the least salt, uh, salt tolerant of our mangrove species. Um, and despite growing further away from the salty low tide area, they're still able to excrete salt. And they do this by two little salt glands um, that are at the bottom of their leaves. And they are given the nickname Frankenstein leaves. So if you were to look up a picture of Frankenstein and his two little knobs on the side of his neck, that's kind of what it looks like for these white mangroves. They also grow more inland as they perform more solid ground soil to grow in. Unlike the red and black mangroves, white mangrove roots are sometimes a little bit more difficult to spot as they are usually covered by soil. They also have a more patchy distribution compared to the other two that we have talked about. Since they grow more inland though, they are a very popular habitat for insects and lizards to hide and live in. And lizards can be spotted sunbathing on their branches sometimes. Our last plant that we are going to talk about is the buttonwood. And these guys are actually not true mangroves. They are associates and are sometimes called gray mangroves. Buttonwoods are not true mangroves because they are less salt, salt tolerant than all true mangroves, like the past three that we have talked about. Because of this, they are therefore found furthest inland and are the last zone in our typical line of zones for mangroves. Buttonwoods can easily be identifiable by their alternating leaf pattern, which you can see in that top photo up there. And then they also have button-shaped flowers. So you can see those little brown balls on their leaves are the little flowers. They are also distinguished by two little, two little salt glands at the base of each leaf, almost like the white mangrove. Ecological importance of mangroves. So 
Mangroves are ecologically important for many reasons. First being that they constantly build new land by sedimentation, uh, which is just leaves falling and decomposing, creating new soil, as discussed earlier with the red mangroves. This then helps to prevent the erosion of land. They are also important because they act as fish nurseries. Juvenile fish like snapper and flounders use the roots of mangroves as shelter from predators. Juvenile lemon sharks have also been found to use mangroves as their hunting ground. We also know that mangroves are important nursery as mangrove leaves have been discovered in the stomachs of over 100 different species of fish, thereby showing the importance of the ecosystem as a food source as well. Mangroves are also a huge carbon dioxide sink, so they create a thick layer of carbon-rich mud where the saline waters of the mangrove prevents the production of a greenhouse gas called methane, therefore storing carbon that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere. Lastly, um, oh, not lastly, but mangroves are also a buffer zone. They um, buffer from storm surges and hurricanes, protecting the inland areas as they are on coastal grounds, as we, as we talked about earlier. Then lastly, they provide a home for a variety of animals. I already mentioned that they're a home for fish, but they're also homes of birds as they nest and roost in the upper limbs of mangrove trees, so birds like egress and herons. They are also homes for insects with spiders, spinning webs, and trapping mosquitoes that reduce that sorry reproduce in the uh, damp roots. Also, marine inverts like crabs, sponges, upside down jellies are also commonly seen along the roots on the sandy bottom of mangrove forest. Their ecological importance uh, doesn't just end there. Mangroves are part of a larger integrated ecological system where they are one pillar of three with coral reefs and seagrass beds being the other two. Each of these ecosystems is a home to a stage of life for many different fish species and are connected in terms of where fish may have grown up, live as adults, or feed at any stage of life. They also act as a buffering system to each other, where corals tend to block wave action for mangroves and seagrass beds, and mangroves and seagrass beds hold and anchor large amounts of sedimentation to keep the coral reefs clear. Lastly, they also help produce carbon dioxide and oxygen for one another and work together in the nutrient cycling that happens within the ocean. So now we know mangroves are ecologically important, but they're also economically important for humans. First being for commercial fisheries. As mentioned previously, mangroves are a critically important fish um, in terms of nurseries. Many ecolog uh, economically important species from nurseries and mangroves, including crabs, shrimps, fish, and mollusks. These fisheries provide a food source and income for, for many coastal communities. Second is timber and plant products. Because mangrove wood is resistant to rot and insects, it is highly valuable and many coastal communities rely on its wood for construction. A variety of other products can also be obtained from mangroves, including tannins to preserve leather and tobacco, dye for cloth, medicines, and also animal fodder which fodder is just a type of animal feed used to feed domesticated livestock. However, use of the mangrove systems, um, of the mangroves for these economic reasons is a sort of unsustainable fashion um, and is contributing to their dis uh, destruction around the globe, which we will talk about next. So threats to mangroves. You can see from this picture, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Southeast Asia has the highest diversity of mangrove species, including some areas where there are over 40 different species. However, these same areas also are at high risk of losing their mangroves. Places like Thailand has lost 84% of its mangroves, 
which is the highest rate of mangrove loss in any nation. While some other places like Tanzania, Mexico, Panama, Malaysia, and the Philippines have lost more than 60% of their mangrove forest. The threats being faced are both natural and anthropogenic, meaning that we as humans are also responsible for it. So let's go through the threats. Uh, anthropogenic threats to mangroves. The first one would be clearing. Mangroves are cleared to make room for agricultural land, human settlements, and infrastructure, such as harbors, and also industrial areas. More recently, clearing for tourist developments, shrimp aquaculture, and salt farms has also taken place. Second, mangroves are overharvested for their use of firewood, construction wood, wood chip, and pulp production, um, and also that animal fodder that I was talking about earlier. Then third, uh, dams and irrigation uh, being built reduces the amount of water reaching mangrove forest, which changes the salinity level of water in the forest. If salinity becomes too high, the mangroves cannot survive. Freshwater di diversions can also lead to mangroves drying out. In addition, increased erosion due to land deforestation can massively increase the amount of sediment in rivers. This can overcome uh, the mangrove's forest filtering ability, leading to the forest being essentially smothered by sediment. Then lastly is pollution. This is pollution like fertilizers, pesticides, and other toxic man-made chemicals carried by river systems from sources upstream. Uh, these fertilizers and pesticides can kill animals living in the mangrove's forest while oil production can also smother mangrove roots and suffocate those trees. So we're going to talk a little bit more deeply about each of these in our next slide. So first starting with clearing of mangroves. Clearing of mangroves can happen in many different ways for a variety of reasons. Some of these reasons include agricultural land, human settlements as I said earlier, and more recently is shrimp aquaculture. Shrimp aquaculture has cleared hundreds of thousands of acres of mangroves to make room for artificial ponds and channels, supplying these ponds with fresh water and salt water. Water diversion is known to be harmful to mangroves because it alters that natural flow of water that is critical to maintaining the health of the surrounding mangroves. Additionally, diverting that water can prevent the seeds that float along the water from being dispersed and also chemicals used to try to keep these large pools of overcrowding shrimp healthy are also contaminating the surrounding freshwater and coastal waters. Next we have over harvesting. So the destruction of mangrove ecosystems in Asia, Central, Central America, and South America has become a pretty common practice. Many of the mangroves in these areas are being cut down and aquaculture focusing on establishing shrimp farms are, has become really highly profitable. They use mudflats, which have been previously occupied by mangroves, which make an ideal environment for culturing shrimp. In the longer term, the removal of mangrove ecosystems, uh, which are an important nursery ground for fish and shellfish, leads to declining wild populations. And also, local fishermen find their livelihood um, being taken away from them uh, as the mangroves are being destroyed and turned into these different sources. Dams and irrigation. So dams and irrigation alter the amount of fresh water and seawater that can reach the mangroves. This then affects the salinity level and if it becomes too high, the mangroves cannot survive. Diverting water can also affect the, um, the amount of seeds that are being spread across, which is necessary to continue the growth of mangroves, as we talked about with red mangroves especially. And then the map on our bottom right is actually a picture of the El, uh, Everglade irrigation system. The Everglades is a subtropical wetland ecosystem that is in Florida, and it's huge, as you can see in that map there. The mangroves are really important to them as they stabilize the coastal line and higher lands by reducing erosion with their roots. 
The mangroves block winds and waves, floods, tides, and storm surges from damaging the land. But there has been some irrigation divergence that have happened over many, many years. The mangroves are threatened um, and are not getting enough fresh water flow. And if, isn't, if there isn't enough fresh water flowing through the Everglades, uh, we may in time lose some of those mangroves. Losing these mangroves then opens up the carbon sinks, which only adds to global warming. In this map, it shows the pre-drainage flow uh, in that first photo, the current flow, and then a restored flow plan that is still in process to be uh, functioning. And it would hopefully then protect species like mangroves. And then lastly is pollution. So we talked about pollution being fertilizers, pesticides, and other toxic man-made chemicals carried by river systems from sources upstream. And all of these sources of pollution can kill those animals that are relying on the mangroves to survive uh, for part of their life cycle. And then also that oil pollution can essentially drown and smother and suffocate the trees um, and thereby killing them. So that is the last of human threats, but we'll go into some natural threats of mangroves. So there are hurricanes and tsunamis and cyclones. So with the increased frequency of weather events, such as the ones mentioned here, the ability of mangroves to resist and protect inland areas from destruction is taken down. For example, Hurricane Matthew in 2016 devastated um, our island here on Andros with damage to the mangrove forest, which can still be seen today. The other one is invasive species. So one invasive species that we can see here is the invasive Australian pine, uh, the casuarina tree, that has been taking over environments that are naturally dominated by mangroves. This has been then causing a detrimental effect to the environment as casuarina trees have really shallow roots that are weak and actually contribute more to erosion. So then these coastal lines are deteriorating, which mangroves don't do. So the mangroves of Andros. So what's happening to them here? It is estimated that 75% of game fish and 90% of commercial species in the Bahamas are dependent upon mangrove systems for the, at least a part of their life cycles. There is also no current law in the Bahamas that prohibits the destruction of mangrove wetlands due to clearing and over-harvesting. And then also, as I just said earlier, there is that casuarina tree that is invasive and can take over the mangroves and take up space and nutrients that those mangroves need and also causing even more erosion than necessary. And then lastly is broken culverts. So these culverts were installed uh, a while ago when they built the roads that are across the island. Although they did install the culverts to maintain water flow, they are now not working in the way that they're supposed to. So they're either broken or clogged, which then leaves the mangrove environment uh, only nourished during certain times when the water floods the road or it is at a high tide, which then results in the degradation of mangroves. But we're talking about all these really sad things about mangroves, but not all hope is lost as something is being done. A restoration project in Love Hill area, which is down south of Andros, founded by the UN, is aiming to restore 96 hectares of mangroves by cleaning out and repairing and installing culverts on all the roads here by replacing um, and also by replacing invasive pine trees with native species. So this Love Hill Restoration Project. The Love Hill Restoration Project is part of the Pine Islands Mangrove Restoration and Innovation Project, which aims to restore mangrove forests in Grand Bahama, New Providence, Abaco, and, the, and here on Andros. We participate in replanting mangroves with Bahamas National Trust when our hawking groups or gap year students are here on Andros and also help by having our beach cleanups there uh, around mangrove areas like Love Hill. This project is founded by the U uh, United 
Nations environmental program and has been running for three years now. Their aim, as I said earlier, is to restore 96 hec hectares of mangrove forest. Currently, they are cleaning out the culverts, as I said earlier, and which is helping improve that tidal flow. And they're also cleaning the beach and the forest from trash, as well as doing some prescribed fires. And great thing is, is that there have been results. So the system is responding really well. There have been a there has been a growth in those mangroves within the last three years. And there are also a lot of seedlings that have been spotted, which is an indication that regeneration is also happening. So yay for our mangroves. And if anyone has any questions now, we will go through those questions and it might take a few seconds. Um, so the mangroves here are really cool here on station. We actually have, I think all three, at least true mangroves here on station. If you go down north of the station, you can see at least the black mangrove and the red mangroves. You can see their prop roots hanging out um, above the water, as I said earlier. And then you can also see the black mangrove snorkel roots hanging about. And you can always find little critters that are hanging out there. So sometimes we see little spotted checker pufferfish, uh, little baby ones, or you can see little baby sergeant majors. So it's really fun to see all those um, fish nurseries going on in live action. And yeah, so if no one has any questions, then we'll wait a little bit longer. But one really exciting thing uh, for next week is that we have a webinar on lionfish. So Kosh and Haley are going to actually be live dissecting a lionfish. For you all, lionfish are an invasive species here on Andros, and we do our best to maintain it and take out as many as we can. So because we feel comfortable taking out those species and essentially spearing them, uh, we decide to use it as an educational experience and uh, do some dissection. So if you're around next week on Thursday at 3 o'clock, tune in to uh, watch our lionfish webinar. It'll be really cool.